morning. And if you will please now turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Revelations chapter number 3. Revelations chapter number 3 and this morning I would like to share with you verse number 7. I'll give you a few moments to find your places in the Word of God and uh, praise the good Lord for the book of Revelations. I tell you it's an exciting book. It reveals a lot of things. It really does. God had appointed the apostle John. John of course was the youngest of the apostles and at the time that he wrote the book of Revelations, he was the last of the living disciples. And at the time that he wrote the book of Revelations, he was in prison for preaching the gospel. Matter of fact, they had put him on the island of Patmos, somewhat like Devil's Island, I would assume. And there he was. But on the Lord's day, the Bible says that God began to speak to him. As a matter of fact, I believe, honestly, that God had called him up into a heavenly throne room. The Bible says, come and see. And I believe that John got to experience heaven. I believe that there's been people that have gone to heaven who have come back and have told us the best that they can, using the words that we have available, how wonderful heaven is. Paul was another one that got called up into the third heaven. I believe that. I believe Lazarus got a, a glimpse at paradise, and he was called back. There have been many who have been called back from the dead who have no doubt testified to the fact that heaven is real. Heaven is wonderful, and I can't wait. It's going to be glorious when we get there. But you want to know something? I'm going to have a good time while I'm here on earth the best I can. I want to see Satan defeated. I'm going to rejoice in this day that the Lord has made. And uh, I'm going to just rejoice because my name's written down in glory. Amen. Well, if, uh, I know I'm going to preach to. Let's stand up and let me get to this morning's message out of the book of Revelations, chapter number 3, beginning with verse number 7. The Bible here says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Our Heavenly Father, we're so glad for your presence right here in our assembly here this morning. We can tell that you are in this place and that you are going to and fro through the presence of your Holy Spirit. You have touched my heart, and I know that you have touched the hearts of multitudes of others who have gathered not only here, but throughout the world. And God, I seek you, dear Heavenly Father, to have your way. I want your will to be done. And I know it's your will for people to be saved. You don't want anybody to perish, dear God. You don't want anybody to wind up going to hell. You want everybody to be saved, but God, we know that not everybody will be saved because they themselves make that decision. It is available, I know, dear God, to whomsoever will. You can't have made it more simple. You couldn't have made it more easier for people to be saved, but yet still people choose not to accept Jesus as your only son, not to accept Jesus as their Savior. And God, I pray that not only here in this auditorium today, but throughout the services throughout the world this day, that many will accept your son, Jesus Christ, as their Lord and as their Savior and allow him to come into their hearts and to begin a great work in their life. Dear Heavenly Father, use me and men like me, dear God, to bring forth the message that is so desperately needed in this trying time that we're living in. Spiritually, dear Heavenly Father, it is getting darker and darker by the moment. And Lord, we need to allow your light to shine in our lives. And dear Heavenly Father, I pray that dear Heavenly Father, people will see in us something that they cannot see in the worldly crowd. For these things I ask in Jesus' name, amen and amen. I love the book of Revelations, and I love what God shows us in these passages of scriptures. But before we really get into the prophetic part of the book of Revelation, God begins to address the conditions that are going on in the churches at the different areas of that time. And this morning, we're looking into this passage of scripture, and God is addressing the church of Philadelphia. Now, Philadelphia is one of the seven churches that God makes mention of in the book of Revelations. Out of the seven churches, God was not well pleased with five of them. And as a matter of fact, God had really told five of them, if they don't get their act together, there's going to be some consequences uh, for their behavior and for the way that they were doing things. But the church of Philadelphia, God says that he was pleased with the way that they were doing things because... 
the church of Philadelphia stuck to the Word of God. Sticking to the Word of God is so vital in this day and time. And I can't express to you how that in many places, even though they're seeing phenomenal growth, that the Word of God is really not being preached. I've listened to a lot of these on the uh, computer, and I enjoy listening to good preaching, and I enjoy hearing good men of God bring forth such wonderful things. But I've listened to some, and I'm telling you, they don't even open the Bible. They don't even quote a scripture. They don't do anything of that nature. They just get up there and begin to talk in men's wisdom, and it's not really getting the job done, as you can see. But in this passage of scripture, in verse number 7, we're going to find that there are five things that describes God. Five things in verse number seven that describes God. I wonder if you can find those five things real quickly. First of all, we're going to look at the first one. And the first one is that it describes God as being holy. Holy. The Bible describes unto us many places about how holy our God is. What does it mean to be holy? It means to be separated. It literally means to be different from the world. And our God is really a holy God. He is a righteous God. Our God is a God above all other things. Our God is holy. Matter of fact, Isaiah chapter 6 and verse number 3, and I don't have this on the overhead, but if you were to look at Isaiah chapter 6 and verse number 3, you would find out that it is said, not once, not twice, but three times, holy, holy, holy. There is only one word that's ever used three times in that type of sequence to describe God, and that's holy. The Bible there says in that passage of Scripture, and thank you guys for bringing that up, and one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Friends, I tell you how long has it been since you've been able to turn to somebody and say, Holy, holy is my God. Holy, holy that we ought to be able to raise our voices up in unison and declare how wonderful our God is. There's wonderful songs that have been written concerning the holiness of our God. I know... Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. See, in there wonderful songs and wonderful passages of scriptures that tells us time and time again how holy our God is. But if you look in your Bibles, you'll also see in the book of 1 Peter chapter number 6, you'll find in, in 1 Peter chapter number 6 that the Bible says for us to be holy, for thou art holy. Let me ask you something this morning. Just how holy are you? <laughs> now, again, what does the word holy mean? It means separated. How different are you from the world? I think you will have to agree with me this morning that there is a vast difference between God and Satan. Wouldn't you agree with me, church? Amen. All right, there is evidently, no doubt about it, a great difference between God and Satan. God is a loving being and Satan is a hateful being. God is a caring being, and Satan is a being who wants to destroy you. God is a person who has created a wonderful place called heaven that he wants everybody to be able to come to, but Satan is bound and determined to see as many people cast into hell as possible. Satan uh, wants to destroy your life when God wants to give you life. Friends, so how much holiness are you? Are you a loving person or are you a hateful person? Are you a caring person? Or are you a person who loves and vast in the destructions of other people? Are you a caring person? Or are you a loving, forgiving person? Or are you somebody that carries a grudge like Satan and who is determined to get vengeance and things of that nature? Just how holy are you? The Bible clearly tells us, be you holy for I am holy. Holy, and one of the great descriptions of God is that He is holy. And we shouldn't be ashamed to go around and tell somebody that our God is holy. Our God is not like Satan. Our God is not like the things of this world. Our God cares about people. Our God wants to help people, not destroy people. Our God wants to strengthen people and to carry the burdens of people where Satan just wants to keep putting more burdens on people. And Oh, how wonderful our God is. But the second thing I see there in the book of Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 7 is the fact that not only he is holy, but I want you to know that our God is true. 
Now here we find that John has been instructed to write this letter to the church of Philadelphia. And Philadelphia is a pagan town, as you can imagine, during that particular town, uh, time there had been a church established there. And so this letter is being written to the Christian church in Philadelphia. But God wanted the Christian church there to realize that he is not only holy, but he is the true God. And you want to think about how hard that would have been to express to other people in that town at that time. It was a difficult time because there were so many other gods. And all these other gods had all kinds of different methods of attracting people to their types of worship. But God here is saying, I'm the true God. There is no other God beside me. And even Jesus in the book of John tells us that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come unto the Father but by me. Well, I'm glad today I know who the true God is. And I'm glad that my God is holy. And I mean, he is different from Satan. He is caring. He is loving. He is a wonderful God. But not only does the Bible tell us there in verse number 7 that he is holy. Not only does the Bible tell us that he is the true God. But it also tells us something pretty exciting. And what it's trying to tell us there is that our God has the keys to the kingdom. Amen. Amen. I like this passage of Scripture, and it comes directly out of the passage of Scripture of Isaiah chapter 22. And out of Isaiah chapter number 22, the Bible there says, And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulders. So he shall open, and none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open. He's got the keys of death, hell. He's got the keys of the kingdom. Man, I'm telling you right now, we are in for a wonderful time because our God's in control. Our God has the authority. What does keys represent? What does keys represent? It means authority. It also means that he has the way of opening an entrance. Jesus Christ has the authority to open an entrance for us to be able to go into heaven. And that's through faith in his precious blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary for our terrible sins. He's got the keys of death and hell. When I read the book of Revelations chapter number 1, and in Revelations chapter number 1, I believe it's been verse number 18 or something, and I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive. Ooh, I'm glad I ain't worshiping some pagan stone. I'm glad I ain't worshiping some object like the sun or the moon. I'm glad, thank goodness, I ain't worshiping some animal like a bird or a bear or a lion or something. Like that. I'm worshiping a living God. I'm worshiping a living God. And I'm worshiping a God that lived and died, but yet he lives again. And when he's got the power to raise himself from the dead, I want to tell you right now, he's got that same power to raise me up when I die. I'm heaven bound this morning, church, and it's not because of anything I've done, but it's because of what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, did. And I accept that. I believe that, and I know that, that I'm going to heaven because of Jesus Christ. Boy, I'm telling you, I'm looking forward to that. But let me get on with the message. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. You know what happened when he died there on the cross? The Bible says he descended into the heart of the earth. And while he was in the heart of the earth, he paid, uh, he paid hell a visit. And he took the keys of hell itself. Satan don't even have the keys to his own home that he's going to be cast into for eternity. Isn't that something? God's in control. Satan's not in control. It might look like that rascal's winning right now. But I want to tell you, his doom is sealed because Jesus Christ has the authority over him that he can't do anything that Jesus Christ don't allow him to do. Jesus has already laid it out in prophetic, biblical doctrines, the things that he's going to allow the devil to do. But there is a limit to what he's going to get by with. And there's coming a day that the devil himself is going to be taken and chained and cast into a bottomless pit, which is known as the abyss itself. He's going to be staying there for a thousand years, and then the Lord's going to release him for a short season. But that old boy's got an appointment with the lake of fire. 
And that old boy is going to wind up in the lake of fire, which is going to burn forever and forever and forever. That's the kind of authority my king's got. That's the kind of authority my Lord has. He is the king of kings, and he is the Lord of lords. And friends, today he is the holy of holies as well. He has all the keys of hell and of death. But we also realize that not only does he have the keys to the kingdom, but he's got a power to open up the door, but he's also got the power to close the door. And for a few moments this morning, I want to share with you the power that Jesus has to open up the door. He has the power to open up the door of blessings. He really does. But there's also the power to close the door, and when he closes the door, you're just out of luck. When I was studying for this passage of Scripture, I kept looking up for pictures, you know, to put on the PowerPoint up there, and I'd find many times over it says when he closes one door, he'll open another. Yeah. Or when he closes one door, he'll open up window. Well, you just show me that in Scripture where God says that's what he does. I hadn't found it. Have you, Susan? When God closes the door, he's closing that door for a reason. When he closed the door, the Bible tells us in the book of Genesis. And in the book of Genesis, chapter number 7, the Bible there says that after Noah had worked for 120 years, building this humongous floating object, because it really didn't represent the looks of a ship at all. It was like a shoebox, literally, built in a rectangular shape. All it was made to do was float. It wasn't made to take people on a cruise to certain destinations. I mean, it took him 120 years to build this massive thing. Remember, he didn't have a chainsaw. I mean, he didn't have a circular saw. He didn't even have electric drills. He had hand tools that had to get, build this humongous object that was able to float for almost a year. Did you realize that? He was up in the water for almost a year. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights, but it was almost a year to the day that he was on the ark. It took him 120 years to do that, but he continued to preach during that time. But at the end of the time, something miraculous was going to happen. God was going to flood the earth. Now, the way God was going to flood the earth was going to be in an unusual manner that no man has ever seen before. Because if you study your Bibles, you're going to find out that there had not been such a thing as rain. All the vegetation and everything of that nature was nourished by the dew. Mankind had not seen. Can you imagine the kind of ridicule Noah was going through? When all these pagans who ever imaginable thing was evil, that's why God said, I'm going to destroy the earth because mankind has given up on me. They've turned to their own evil thoughts. They're going in their own evil, like today. Doesn't the Bible say such as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the second coming of the Lord? I'll tell you, friends, you better be looking up. For redemption's drawing nigh. Amen. But anyway, we find out that Noah here is building this floating object and his large object that's able to hold, I mean, just all kinds of animals and shapes and sizes and everything like that. But he gets on this ark. God says it's time to get on the ark. Of course, there is a door on the ark. Noah gets on the ark, and during that 120 years, the only people that he was able to reach was his family. If there's anybody I would be able to reach, I don't know about you, I would want to be able to reach my family. I want to reach everybody, and I want everybody to be saved, but I want to tell you who's nearest and dearest to my heart. I, I, I love you all, <laughs> and I don't want none of you to wind up in hell. I don't want none of you to wind up in hell but if I can reach anybody, I want to reach my family. And Noah reached his family. He didn't have to ho hog tie them boys, and he didn't have to drag them on there. Listen, they was a hundred and some years old. <laughs> they went in on their own accord. They went in willingly. They didn't have to be drugged to church. <laughs> they went because they wanted to go, and they believed what God was going to do. They believed what their dad was preaching. Because his dad preached in 120 years, but nobody, over 2 billion people, is estimated lived on this earth during the times of the flood. 
2 billion people. And Noah and his family got on the ark. And the Bible here says that God in his power closed the door. As God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Noah didn't close that door. Because what do you think Noah might would have done? When that rain started coming, can you see that picture fairly clearly? And the water began to rise up. The Bible says that the water began to gush up from the earth. All the fountains of the deep, all the fountains of the earth began to rise up. The rain began to rain. It, it, it poured rain for 40 days, 40 nights. The water continued to come up and come up. Maybe a great, great glacier, global warming. I don't know if all the uh, uh, ice caps and everything else. I don't know what all transpired, but I know this. When I was out in Arizona, I seen mountain tops out there that were higher than Mount Mitchell here in the Smoky Mountains, and they were seashell. They were seashells. Uh, uh, up there on, on the top of those mountain reg regions, the earth at one time no doubt was covered in water. You can't deny it. They were up there. Fossils were up there with animals, seashells, and fishes and things like that. They had, I mean, my goodness, high up, how did they get up there? You know? Well, of course, mankind's got an answer, but I ain't going to preach on that this morning. <laughs> but they had an answer for it. But listen to me. If Noah or I or you would have gotten on that boat, the rain started coming and the water started rising. And there'd be people out there starting to knock on. I mean, can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? No! No! Let me in! Let us in! If Noah would have been the one that closed the door, then Noah would have had the ability to what? But God didn't leave that in Noah's hands. God says that there is a deadline. God gave them 120 years. God even warned them that his spirit will not always strive with man. I warn you just about every service. That it's not when you want to and it's not according to your timetable. But when God is opening up the door for you to be saved, then you better take advantage of when God and his power and his mercy, his holiness opens up the door and wants you to come in and to receive Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior because I want to also tell you that there are times when the Lord shuts the door. And the Lord shut the door on the ark. And it doesn't matter how many of the millions or hundreds or thousands or how many lived there in the area where Noah was knocking on the door. Can you imagine them screaming? I mean, they didn't just lay down and just drown. I mean, can you imagine what that was a chaotic type scene that was going on there? And they tried and they tried on their own to be saved. And there's people today who are trying. I mean, how long can you tread water? Can you tread water for 40 days, 40 nights, storms raging, waves of blow? I mean, it would be a terrible onslaught. God closed the door. And I want to tell you right now, he didn't open up another one. Two billion people perished because they had turned from God. They felt like they didn't need God even though they had been warned by Noah. They turned from God, and God says, I regret making mankind. He closed the door. There's other times when God closes the door of salvation. He also closes the door of opportunities to receive a blessing. When I look in the book of Numbers, chapter number 14, I begin with verse number 22 especially. Now this is a miraculous thing that has transpired in the life of the children of Israel. They had been enslaved for how many years, church? You know? That's right. 400 years. They had been enslaved in Egypt. Hard labor. 400 years. God sent Moses there and said, It's time to let my children go. 
And God performed how many miracles right there before Pharaoh? Many. How many miracles did the children of Israel see how powerful their God was when he parted the Red Sea and destroyed the Egyptian armies? And God brought them to a place where they could enter into the promised land of Canaan. He had already showed them that he was God. He would already showed them the power that he had. He brought them right to the very entrance. All they had to do was cross over the Jordan River. They done crossed over the Red Sea on dry ground. They sent spies over into the Canaan land, and they spied out the land, and it was just like God said it would be. It was filled with milk and honey. It was a special place. It was a wonderful place that could sustain three and a half million people. That's how many Jewish people were set free. Three and a half million people. And the spies came back and 10 of the spies said, it's like God says, we brought you samples. You can see the grapes. You can see it's a land of milk and honey. But there's giants in the land. We can't do it. And three and a half million people believe those 10 spies and refused to go on in and receive the great blessings of God. And verse number 22 and through chapter number 14 says, Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice, he goes on to say in the next verse there, Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. I want to tell you, there is a time when God says, I'm shutting the door. God said, I wanted to give you Canaan land. I wanted you to go over there and have it. I made everything possible. I showed you how powerful I was. I can destroy the most powerful army in the world, and you're worried about a few giants that live in this land that I've been told you you could have? They said, we can't take it. And God says here, okay, you're not going to get it. Then he goes on to say in the next frame there, Brother John, and then the Lord there is trying to tell them, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness, and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from 20 years old upward, which have murmured against me. He is telling you, all you that just said you wasn't going to go forward, you've chosen not to receive the things I wanted for you. You're not going to ever receive it because all of you men, especially that are 20 years old or older, you're going to die in the wilderness before your children and your grandchildren will be able to go into Canaan land. Over 600,000 men would die. You know how many that is every day for 40 years? I mean, numerous people were dying every day. Because they would not accept what God wanted to give for them. God closed the door. But I can also tell you that God closes the door of opportunity sometimes to be saved. Look in your Bibles in the book of John now. In your Bibles in the book of John, chapter number 8, I believe it is chapter number 8. The Bible here and Jesus is speaking to the religious people. There's so many religious people in the world today, it's hard to win them to Jesus. You want to know who's the hardest people to win? Those who've got a little religion. Yeah, I, I went to church 30 years ago. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to heaven. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I got my little sticker when I was in Sunday school. I'm going to heaven. Well, my mom and dad, you know, they were good church people. I'm going to go to heaven. The religious crowds are the hardest ones to reach, aren't they, Jim? They got a little religion. They're holding on to some false security blanket or something saying, well, you know, I, I, I've got this figured out. And, and sister uh, 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 over there can tell you these things. How did the devil can conceive, uh, deceive you? Jesus here is speaking. He just done some miraculous things. And here's that religious crowd coming up to Jesus Christ. And they are saying, and then Jesus turns around. Now he's telling these religious leaders. Then said Jesus again unto them. I go my way, and you shall seek me and shall die in your sins. Whether I go, you cannot come. Guess what Jesus just did there for that religious crowd? He just closed the door. Did he open another door for them? 
He says, I'm going away. You want to know where Jesus was going? He's going to heaven. And he even says that in that passage of scriptures, and you shall seek me, but it's too late. You shall die in your sins, which means you're going to hell. Whether I go, you can't come. And again, he tells us in another verse there in chapter number 8, in the next passage there, Brother John, he says, I say therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins, for you believe not that I am he, and you shall die in your sins. The door was closed, and there wasn't another door open. I believe that there's such a thing as a deadline. And I believe God opens the door of salvation for people and for opportunities or things of that nature. And when God does that, I'm not seeing where God says, when I close the door, no man can open it. When I say that's enough, no man can open it. And when he's talking about salvation especially, I don't care how long I stay up here. I don't care how long I keep you here to, today. Uh, I could keep you here to 2 or 3 o'clock, and it doesn't mean not one of you is going to get saved. Probably most of you get mad, and, and really, truly, most of you leave. <laughs> But if God's not opening up the door and saying, come in, he's giving you that opportunity. And all, he's, all you got to do is just come to the Lord. But then the Lord says, all right, I'm going to close the door. And it don't matter how long the preacher preaches. It don't matter how much he hollers. It don't matter how much he tries. You ain't coming. You ain't coming. I'm going to close with this passage of Scripture that comes out of Corinthians. And from the book of Corinthians, chapter number 6, verse number 2, 2 Corinthians, the Bible says this, Behold, now is the accepted time. Now the, is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. God has opened the door. God's given you an opportunity to be saved. Don't let God have to close the door on you. Don't let God have to close the door on you because when he closes the door, I can't open it. And if God closes the door, I, I don't care what might transpire in your life. You're not going to heaven. If God closes the door, that's it. Let's stand to our feet. Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you in your presence, and we are thankful, dear God, for the power that you have. You truly are holy, <laughs> and you are the true God. There is no other God. There is no other way, Almighty God. There is no other way. It is not by good works. It is not through church memberships. It is not through church ordinances. Or, it's only through Jesus. It's only through your Son, Jesus Christ. By faith, a stepping before Him and saying, Lord, forgive us of our sins. Forgive me of my sins. Lord Jesus, save my soul. Come into my life. Take control of my life. Make me what you want me to be. There's only one way of salvation. Why don't you come? If you've never been born again, doesn't matter how good you are. Doesn't matter how many church memberships you might have. Doesn't matter how many times you may have been baptized. If you've never been born again, then why not right now let this be the day of salvation for you? Let this be the hour. Don't wait because God can close that door God can say, I've reached out to you. God can say, I tried and I tried. I've spoken to your heart. I wanted you to be saved, but you've chosen not to be saved. I'll not bother you no more. And there'll come a day you'll want to go, but you can't. There'll come a day when you wish you would have come, but you're going to die in your sin. And you're not going to be able to go to where Jesus is, and that's heaven. You'll die in your sins. It don't matter how religious you are, it doesn't matter. If you've never been born again, Jesus said, you shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If you've never been born again, you shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Why don't you come? Why don't you come? These things, dear God, we ask in Jesus' name that you would touch hearts, that you draw people to you right now, dear God, as only you can. We leave it now in your hands. God, have your way for these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you this morning.
McKenzie, let me just share this wonderful news with everybody, McKenzie. For the Bible says we shouldn't be ashamed. You know, we shouldn't. That publicly, we are professed Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Isn't that right? All right. This morning, what a special time God has given us. Here's Mackenzie. She has come today, and she has asked Jesus Christ to forgive her of her sins, to come into her life, take control of her life. She's wanting to serve the Lord. And that's right, isn't it, Mackenzie, that you've trusted Jesus as your Savior. Amen. I hope the church will come by and just let her know how grateful you are for her friends or families wanting to come down and stand with us. That would be great as well. But just let her know that you're glad that she's now going to heaven that she's now our sister in Christ, and, and we're going to be there for her to help her along this life's journey any way that we can, and, and uh, we're just so excited. We're so excited for you, Mackenzie. Amen? All right. Well, God bless you for coming this morning, and uh, don't forget to come back tonight if you can. We're going to be preaching on the least known of the Trinity, the least known of the Trinity, but the one that we're the most exposed to, the Holy Spirit of God. All right? Don't forget, next Sunday morning, we're going to be having a baptismal service. I'm so excited about that. And I'm going to be meeting with all of those that are going to be baptized right over here in the corner about 20 minutes till 11. And don't forget, you get an extra hour of sleep next Sunday morning, okay? Bring your family and friends with you, really and truly. That's the, most, that's the easiest morning to convince them to get up and come with you. They get an extra hour of sleep and all this sort of thing. Bribe them, pay them. I don't care what you have to do to get them here, but let's get them here and uh, I'll meet with those that are going to be baptized about 20 minutes to 11 right down here. And uh, Mackenzie, think about being baptized. And there's several others that are going to be baptized. What a great, great time. And that's publicly proclaiming.